Federal government has laid out new gun control legislation. I think it's a deliberate attack on lawful firearms owners in Canada. It's got nothing to do with public safety and they know that. Are law-abiding firearm owners in Canada unfairly under attack? As the Trudeau government plans to confiscate hundreds of thousands of legally acquired guns at a cost to taxpayers of almost one billion dollars. But does the Trudeau government's gun ban really make Canadians any safer? Are violent crimes actually committed using legally acquired guns? Or is this all just another political distraction that accomplishes nothing, wastes taxpayers' money, and throws law-abiding Canadians completely under the bus? You can ban it, but it's not gonna, the people that you're targeting don't adhere to laws. My name is Aaron Gunn, and this is Politics Explained. It's been a violent 24 hours. Toronto police have responded to five shootings in the city's north end. Four men shot, one pronounced dead while children played nearby. These men opening fire on five teenagers before fleeing a Toronto apartment building. We can all agree that gun violence in Canada is shocking and unacceptable. Shootings in our city streets reduce our country to a dystopian society of unhinged brutality. But how serious is this problem in Canada? What guns are predominantly used? And what, if anything, can we do about it? I sat down with Christina Howran, an investigative journalist from Toronto and producer of the documentary The Gun Chase, which examined these very questions. Is there a serious gun violence problem in Canada's major cities like Toronto? There absolutely is a serious problem, and especially in Toronto when it comes to gun violence. And that's what really prompted the documentary. Mainstream news couldn't cover every shooting in depth the way that it would perhaps in a smaller community. But even murders were being like, oh, this guy died or this person died, and then we never hear anything about it because the shootings were so rampant. In fact, in 2010, Canada ranked fifth out of all OECD countries for gun deaths per capita. And since then, Thanks to violence in many of Canada's largest cities, it's only gotten worse. Since 2009, there has been an 81% increase in violent gun offences across the country. And in Toronto alone, 760 people were shot in 2019. An increase of more than 300% from just five years earlier. But it's not just gang violence in big cities where gun violence can occur. Structure fire. Uh, there's a person down there with a gun. Uh, they're still looking for him. It's very vague. What's going on down there? It's laying there for hours. All I could hear was explosions from the fires and gunshots coming all from all around me. On April 18th, 2020, 51 year old Gabriel Wortman attacked several communities around Halifax, Nova Scotia, while impersonating a police officer. By the time he was shot and killed by the RCMP, he had murdered 22 people and injured three others, resulting in the deadliest rampage in Canadian history. Last week, 22 Canadians were killed in the deadliest rampage in our country's history. We are closing the market for military-grade assault weapons in Canada. Two weeks after the Nova Scotia attack, without consenting Parliament, Justin Trudeau outright banned over 1,500 firearm models, deeming them, quote, military-grade assault weapons. This included the very popular and widely used for recreation AR-15, and later, for whatever reason, a wide array of others that included airsoft rifles and even paintball guns, many of which will now be forcibly purchased and confiscated by the Trudeau government in what's known as the Federal Gun Buyback Program. May 1st, uh, 2020, the Liberals rolled out their, their new gun ban. Uh, you know, a, a ban of probably up to a million individual firearms from hundreds of thousands of individual Canadians. 
overnight they're told to look sorry you can't use those anymore and you can't you can't sell them and you just basically have to store them in their their boat anchor sitting in your firearm safe but they didn't do it through the usual way or i guess the the appropriate way which would have been legislation they used an order in council which is a legal instrument that they have at their disposal um, but that instrument is not meant to be abused to pass massive actions like a gun ban. There's even a provision in the order in council, uh, the specifics around what you can use an order in council for. It was never uh, supposed to be allowed to be used to reclassify firearms, ironically. Really? Yeah. But will Trudeau's gun ban actually make a difference? Are law-abiding owners of these 1,500 firearms really to blame for the gun violence in Canada? And I didn't really understand, and I still don't, how we could have such high levels of gun violence when we have some of the strictest gun control laws already in the Western world. What I did find out was that 85% of the handguns used in crimes in Toronto alone last year were sourced back to the States. Now that doesn't mean that 15% were sourced domestically. It means that some of them they couldn't actually trace back and overwhelmingly they're being smuggled in from the States. When filming her documentary, Christina made the amazing discovery that at least 85% of all handguns used in Toronto crimes were illegally sourced and smuggled across the border from the United States. We live next door to the largest producer of firearms on the, on the face of the planet. And, and almost every police association in this country will tell you that the vast majority of firearms used in crime, mostly by gang members in this country, has come across that border illegally. Police and the gun smuggler that I spoke with and former gang leaders all say that they can be smuggled across in many different ways. Primarily though, it's by land border crossings. Sometimes you have a mule, but sometimes it's as simple as going over to an unmanned border crossing and throwing a bag of guns or ammunition over the border. But what about the tragedy in Nova Scotia? Were the guns used in that case legally purchased in Canada or were they smuggled in from the States? So the order in council came uh, right on the heels of the massacre in Nova Scotia. That was the opportunity that the Liberals saw to roll out a gun ban. It probably wasn't the best time to do that because the perpetrators' guns were overwhelmingly smuggled from the United States. They had uh, Canadian regulation had no effect on his ability to secure firearms or how he used them. Even the perpetrator of the Nova Scotia attacks used illegally smuggled guns from the U.S. The ease of moving these firearms across our border with the United States is primarily due to it being the largest undefended border in the world at 8,800 kilometers long. This allows organized crime in cities like Toronto to buy and sell firearms smuggled in from the U.S. with ease. And in our neighbors to the south, Canadian criminals find an endless supply. There are 120 firearms in the United States for every 100 people, meaning there are more firearms in the US than there are citizens, a trend that's only been increasing. This makes the US by far and away the world leader in gun ownership, with Canada a distant second in the OECD. But unlike the US, where gun ownership is a right guaranteed by the Constitution, in Canada, we do things a little differently. Firearms are extremely tightly controlled in Canada. Um, you cannot own a firearm without a license. First, you have to take two or three day course, depending on kind of license that you want. So you have to do a practical test, just showing that you know how to safely handle a gun, how to safely load it, store it pass it with 80% or more, you have to provide personal references. So for non-restricted firearms, you've got to present that license and it has to be valid. Uh, with restricted, restricted are even more complicated. So restricted are actually registered to the individual owner. And once you've selected the handgun you want, then we initiate what we call a transfer. So that's taking that registration certificate and, and having the RCMP Firearms Centre in Miramichi transfer it from um, our ownership, the, the, the stores, the gun shop's ownership, to the individual's ownership. At that point, you enter into a program called continuous eligibility screening. So what that means is, if I have a PAL, a possession and acquisition license in Canada, I'll have a criminal record check, so to speak, every 24 hours electronically to make sure that I don't get into trouble. You're checked on every day. We're, we're the most watched over population actually in the country. 
and for restricted firearms like handguns, once it's in your home, you must legally have it locked in a safe with a trigger lock. And when transporting restricted firearms, you must get permission beforehand while keeping them locked and secure at all times. And many legal firearm owners in Canada do this consistently and safely every single day. There are about 2.3 million Canadians uh, licensed to own non-restricted firearms and there are 640,000 Canadians that are licensed to own handguns and restricted firearms. So it's a lot of people. But what about the quote unquote military grade assault weapons that Trudeau and the Liberals continuously warn us about? I wanted to know what license you need before you can buy a fully automatic military grade assault weapon in Canada like the ones I used to use when I was in the Canadian Army Reserves. Have you ever been allowed to legally sell here in this store in Canada military style assault weapons? No. No, there is the military doesn't use anything that the civilian market consumes in Canada. Military grade doesn't really mean a lot, I mean, other than usually select or full auto fire. So those, those types of firearms are reserved strictly for military use. Even the police generally don't use them. But I find a lot of Canadians, when they hear that, and I've talked to them, when they hear military style assault weapons, they think fully automatic weapons where you pull down the trigger and just round after round after round. Uh, gets shot out the barrel of the gun, but those aren't actually legal in Canada. So full autos, what are actually assault rifles, I guess by definition, um, have been banned since 1977 in Canada. No one that has a regular PAL or restricted PAL, that's our license in Canada, no one that has a license like that owns any military rifles. It's just not true. They haven't been legal in Canada since the 70s, and simply they haven't been accessible to anybody in Canada for 40 years. So if licensing and Canadian gun laws are so strict, why would Canadians go to such great lengths to own firearms in Canada? What's the reason why people even own firearms in this country at all? The legal reasons to own a firearm in Canada, if you're talking about non-restricted firearms are, hunting, target shooting, collecting, and inheritance. Those are the reasons. And restricted firearms um, is the same thing minus hunting because you can't hunt with a restricted firearm. You know, I use firearms uh, for enjoyment. It's mm -hmm. part of our family. We go out, uh, we either shoot skeet or we go uh, target shooting at the local range or once in a while we go, uh, we'll go hunting. But mostly for sporting purposes, shotguns for shooting trap and skeet, uh, handguns for shooting various types of competitions. So, been around for a long time and in popular use, yes. Recreational shooting is so common in Canada that we have our own professional shooting leagues whose participants compete internationally. I met with one of these athletes, Amanda Fisher, a professional sports shooter who competes in the popular three-gun competition, using a pistol, a shotgun, and the standard semi-automatic rifle, commonly known as the AR-15. Um, I've been shooting IPSC since 2016 and um, I've traveled all across the country doing that and it was just five years ago, six almost, six years ago, I took my firearms license because I wanted to get out to the range, I wanted to try it. I was super intimidated, it was so empowering, like it makes you feel, it, it, it's like, it's like a high, You're, it's just like a high on life and it's like exhilarating. How has the Trudeau gun ban affected you specifically and your sports shooting career? Um, it has put a stop to it. Um, it has put a stop because the tool that I use is an AR-15, it's a Daniel Defense and it's an amazing firearm. Although the majority of gun crimes are committed with handguns and not sporting rifles, Trudeau's order and council explicitly banned the AR-15, a rifle that between 2015 and 2019 was responsible for exactly zero deaths in Canada. This has forced Amanda to stop competing in three-gun competitions. Determined not to give up, Amanda has used this time to work on her other skills, including pistol and shotgun shooting. Well, Amanda, thanks so much for having us, showing us how it's done here on the range and teaching us about firearms. Well, thanks for having me, and um, I think it's your turn now. 
My turn. <laughs> yeah. It became obvious to me that Amanda and Canadians like her see sports shooting as an essential part of their identity. And whether it's hunting, recreation, or competitive shooting, if it's done in a safe way, there's no reason why responsible Canadians can't be trusted with firearms. But firearms are more than just a tool of recreation. Uh, people own them for all of those reasons. So not only can you target shoot and hunt and recreational shoot, but you can also protect yourself mm -hmm. from, from predators, whether they're in the, in the bush, you could also protect yourself from violent assault. Mm -hmm. It's a tool, it's like a, it's like a sporting good, but all of a sudden it could, it could save your life if, the, if you really needed it. Self-defense with a firearm may seem like a completely foreign idea to people living in cities. But for those in rural Canada, surrounded by kilometers of farmland or wilderness, and where police response times can stretch to over an hour, it's a real concern. Um, people in rural areas use their firearms to defend their property from things like bears and wolves and coyotes and foxes and all that sort of thing. So that, that happens on a daily basis right across the country. Canada's still a very rural country. It's a very big country. People have to face that crisis alone. And so they'll have to decide, you know, do I have a plan in place and what does the situation look like? Could I actually get out the back door? So number one is get out alive. But if you are in a situation where you're confronted and you have to respond to that, you need to have some options. And, and it might not just be you, it might actually be a family. So what, what happens if you have a bunch of guys roll into your property one night and you are 45 minutes away from the nearest police station and they hop out of the truck and they decide they're going to start stealing your gas or kicking your door down, which is even worse. What, what are you supposed to do in a situation like that? Wait? I don't think anybody would argue with the fact that the use of a firearm is obviously a measure of last resort. Yes. But to take that measure of last resort away from rural residents when in some cases, rare cases, but in some cases they don't have any other options, to me doesn't seem reasonable or fair. So the question I would pose is, are we going to remove the opportunity or the ability for people to defend themselves when they're facing something and they might be facing it alone? And for many rural residents, this isn't just hypothetical. Corey Morgan, a resident of Foothills County, Alberta, had his former bar broken into on more than one occasion by armed and dangerous criminals. These guys came in, we showed with the video footage we had actually of uh, the break-ins, they had long crowbars with them. And in hindsight, we did find out with these guys, uh, four of them who hit us repeatedly, uh, one of them is now deceased, another one of them is up on murder charges for shooting a 19-year-old up in Airdrie. These were very dangerous individuals, obviously, in, in, in hindsight and looking at it. So I think it's pretty safe to presume they were probably armed when they were going around on their crime spree out here too. So if somebody encountered them, it, it, could, it could have ended very badly. But this is only one of many examples of criminals taking advantage of the slow and sometimes non-existent police response times in rural Canada. For example, in 2017, the crime rate in rural Alberta was 38% higher than in urban areas. Another example is the case of Eddie Maurice, a young father living just outside Okotoks, Alberta. Eddie uh, lives down south of here in the south end of Foothills County. Uh, he's in a rural property. His wife actually was out of town, I believe she was in Ottawa or Toronto. Uh, Eddie was alone and his, his young uh, toddler of a daughter was in the house. And at five in the morning he heard noises outside. He went outside and there were intruders in his yard. He grabbed a uh, 22 rifle and fired a warning shot into the ground, uh, telling him to get out of there. One ran, the other ran towards him. He fired a second warning shot and the guy took off. He called the police and it was about two hours, I think he said later, the police showed up with a tactical squad and arrested him. And uh, so they arrested Eddie for uh, a number of firearms charges and, and uh, aggravated assault and, and a whole pile of charges. They kept him in uh, police custody, I believe, for about 36 hours. And uh, yeah, it took months to resolve that, that whole thing before the charges were finally dropped against him. The case of Eddie Maurice and the targeting of countless gun owners in Canada shows an illogical and unfortunate reality in this country. It's always law-abiding Canadians that are targeted by the government, the reasons for which always seem to be political. 
I mean, the firearms issue has always been a wedge issue, right? It's a perfect way to divide people because we only represent about 2.2 million people in this country. So it's it's a really it's a perfect demographic to take and and vilify and and create division between us and everybody else. And really, that's what this government has been about. So the government says, hey, licensed gun owners are the issue. So you have all the people that don't know any better saying, oh my God, look at all of these horrible people that are gun owners. Gun owners are standing back going, I haven't done anything. I'm not going to do anything. I've been minding my own business and I don't want the government in my life. And now not only do I have the government in my life, I have all of these other Canadians that have been lied to now that hate me for no reason. And that's, a, that's why it's so divisive and that's why it's such a problem. But aside from targeting law-abiding Canadians, what else has the Trudeau government done on the gun violence issue in Canada? Well, not long after bringing in his gun ban, Justin Trudeau introduced Bill C-22. Incredibly, this bill not only does nothing to target the possession of illegal firearms, it actually reduces sentencing for serious crimes committed with illegally obtained guns. This includes completely removing mandatory minimum sentences for weapons trafficking, robbery with a firearm, and the possession of a weapon obtained through crime. All these dangerous offenses and many others will now have no minimum sentencing requirements whatsoever. Trudeau government brings in this legislation targeting law-abiding gun owners, mm -hmm. and then a couple months later actually reduces the sentencing for people that commit crimes. Two using days later. Two days two later. Two days later. So the, the legislation for C-21 came in, uh, uh, what was it, Tuesday, I believe, or Monday, and literally two days later, uh, C-22 came in, which actually lessened uh, the consequences for some pretty significant uh, firearms-related crimes. <laughs> So the irony is rich for this government, yes. What kind of a message are we sending when we actually, when we actually uh, put forth legislation that, that removes punishment from people doing illegal things, from hurting other people, actually hurting other people, and punish people who aren't hurting other people? It's got nothing to do with public safety, and, and as I've said before, they know that, right? It's all about staying in power and making sure that uh, that grip on power never gets loosened. So, is there a gun violence problem in Canada? Well, yes, but it's not with law-abiding Canadians. It's with organized crime taking advantage of a weak border, a continent awash with guns, and a political establishment here in Canada that targets legal gun owners rather than the criminals that abuse them. And you can ban every gun you want in the world. Criminals don't abide by the law. That's, that's right in their definition. Criminals don't care about what's legal and what isn't legal. Yeah. You know, criminals won't even know, they don't even know that there was a gun ban. They don't even know what the regulations are, much less would be affected by them. Uh, they don't follow the law in the rest of their lives. Why would they follow it in regards to firearms? So It's not people like us who are causing the problem. It never has been. Um, it's, it's people who are involved in illegal activity already who are causing the problem and they don't obey the laws to begin with. This is just simple common sense, it's, it's simple logic. Even some police officers that I spoke with said a gun ban will do nothing. A gun ban is a band-aid solution that will make some individuals feel safer but it won't actually help to eradicate gun violence on our streets. Do you think the Trudeau government's what is essentially a gun ban makes Canadians safer? It, it doesn't and it actually makes them more unsafe because it, it takes those um, sparse resources and it goes after law-abiding firearms owners instead. So it does the opposite, it actually makes Canadians more unsafe. My name is Aaron Gunn and this has been Politics Explained.